Hello and welcome to lecture 56 of analog integrated circuit design. We were discussing voltage regulators and stability constraints. We will continue from that point. We have the transistor M0, which is usually called the pass transistor. We have a feedback voltage divider so that we can get uh, the required output voltage and a reference voltage that comes from a band gap reference. The load current, we have an output capacitor that is required in order to limit the transients when uh, uh, IL steps up or steps down and one of the other uh, important poles is caused by CGS0, the gate source capacitance of transistor M0. This amplifier in the feedback loop is said to have a transconductance GM1 and an output resistance RO1 okay. and this M0 has some uh, uh, GM0 and an output resistance RDS0 at the operating point okay. So we evaluated the frequency response and saw that the dominant pole is likely to be from the output node okay. This is A0 the DC loop gain and this pole will be at approximately 1 by RDS0 times C0 it will have a minus 20 dB per decade roll off and for stability the pole introduced by this uh, CGS0 must be beyond the unity loop gain frequency okay and this pole is going to be at 1 over CGS0 RO1 and the unity loop gain frequency will be at A0 which is GM1 RO1 GM0 RDS0 and this ratio R2 by R1 plus R2 I will call this uh, beta times beta times the value of the pole which is 1 over RDS0 C0 okay and we know that for a good enough uh, phase margin for stability we would like P2 to be more than omega u loop here I will not specify how much more but I will just work with these inequalities okay. So this basically says RO1 less than some value okay which happens to be okay so now because the value of ro1 is limited okay we can only have a certain DC loop gain okay the DC loop gain is GM1 RO1 GM0 RDS0 times beta okay and because the value of RO1 has an upper limit we can only have a certain value of DC gain which limits the DC load regulation. We saw that the load regulation basically is represented by the closed loop output resistance of this circuit which is RDS0 divided by 1 plus DC loop gain and the DC loop gain will be limited because the output resistance of the amplifier RO1 has to be limited to a certain value. If that value becomes very high the pole associated with CGS0 will move to low frequencies and the phase margin will be very poor okay.
Now also uh, the other thing is that in a normal amplifier we have the operating point and more or less we can think of uh, signals as uh, small variations around the operating point. Even with amplifiers that operate with fairly large signals many of the uh, crucial parameters can still be considered constant. But in a voltage regulator that is not the case the quiescent current flowing in the voltage regulator must be very small and the load current can vary all the way from 0 to some very high values okay. So this means that the value of GM0 and RDS0 that is the small signal parameters of the transistor M0 can vary very widely okay. So GM0 would be related to if the transistor obey square law and RDS0 is lambda IL they have different kinds of variations that is RDS0 uh, sorry RDS0 is 1 over lambda IL okay. So RDS0 has an inverse proportion inverse uh, relationship with IL and GM0 has the square root dependence on IL okay. But the bottom line is uh, GM0 will increase and GDS0 which is the reciprocal of RDS0 will increase with increasing IL okay. Now if you look at this, this condition has to be evaluated at the worst case and the worst case is at the maximum value of IL because that is when this GM0 will be maximum okay. Now if you expand the relationship for A0 okay we will get GM1 R01 GM0 RDS0 times beta which is basically GM1 square root of C0 by CGS0 times One over GM one GM zero times beta, which times GM zero RDS zero beta. Okay, which basically translates to square root of C zero by CGS zero times square root of GM one GM zero beta times RDS zero. Okay. Again you see that the worst case of this is for uh, high values of IL okay. For large values of IL GM0 will be larger and RDS0 will be smaller but GM0 has a square root dependence on uh, IL whereas RDS0 has a direct dependence on IL. So this A0 if you look at this constraint will reduce with uh, increasing IL for a given GM1. Now one of the other questions is why cannot we just increase GM1. Now that is possible but uh, depending on the amplifier structure it will be limited because you would like to limit the quiescent current in the amplifier that is because that is the wasted current you would like the total current to be almost equal to the load current. So under those constraints it becomes harder to increase GM1. Now there are possibilities you can have uh, slower amplifiers with uh, overall higher effective GM1 and so on. In this case what I have assumed is that the amplifier is a simple uh, differential pair type of transconductor. Okay. So under those conditions the worst case for stability is when IL is maximum and also the output resistance of the amplifier must be limited to some value which means that DC loop gain is limited which in turn means that the load regulation is limited to certain extent.
okay. So, these are the constraints resulting from uh, the stability constraint of this feedback loop. Now, it turns out reality is even more complicated than this. Now, this value of y l can be very large that means that the value of c naught has to be also very very large. Now, as you know a capacitor uh, there is no such thing as a pure capacitor it will always have a series resistance and a series inductance and how much series resistance you have really depends on the physical size of the capacitor and larger the value of the capacitor the larger the physical size and you can get a larger effective series resistance it is termed ESR or effective series resistance. So, if you look at the equivalent circuit of a capacitor ideally it is supposed to be like that in reality you will have the effective series resistance and also an effective inductance and this capacitance C okay. And if you plot the magnitude of the impedance of the capacitor versus frequency ideally of course it should drop off at 20 dB per decade and go on indefinitely as you go to very high frequencies you get very low impedance that is the purpose of using the capacitor. But in reality what happens is that you will have some effective series resistance. So, it will limit it to this value and you will also have effective series inductance okay, whose impedance actually increases with frequency. So, this corresponds to 1 over omega c and this corresponds to omega times L E S L. So, the overall impedance looks something like this okay. whether you see a flat region or not depends on the relative values of the effective series inductance and effective series resistance, but this is where it is capacitive this is where it is resistive and this is where it is inductive. So, although you use a large capacitor beyond a certain frequency the impedance does not reduce. Okay. Now, this introduces complications because Here we have this R E S R. Let us ignore the effective series inductance for now and consider only the effective series resistance. In that case, what happens is the gain from this point to that point will get modified. Okay. So, let me redraw the gain from A to B. through the transistor M0 we earlier saw that it has a DC gain of GM0 RDS0 and a pole at 1 over RDS0 times CO and it has a first order roll off. Okay. Now, in presence of the effective series resistance okay, let us say this is M0 and we have R E S R and I have ignored the other load that appears here. Now, this M naught is loaded by the resistance and the series combination and the series combination is equivalent to the capacitor at low frequencies. Okay, the capacitive reactance is much higher than the resistance value, but as you go to higher frequencies the capacitive reactance will become smaller than the effective series resistance and the gain will be dominated by the effective series resistance. Okay. So, for a certain ESR it may look like this where this value of gain is essentially given by GM0 times R ESR okay. and as the value of ESR increases you could even have stuff like that okay, where GM0 times R ESR becomes more than 1 that is also possible. So, now what happens? the gain of the other part which is g m 1 r o 1 times beta will be of some shape like that. Okay. Now, the overall transfer function 
in absence of any effective series resistance would be exactly as we had earlier. So, it would be like that and let me show this pole at a higher frequency. So, in absence of uh, any effective series resistance, the loop gain uh, magnitude response will look like that one. Okay. Now, if you draw it corresponding to the red curve over here. and at this point it becomes flat and if you draw it corresponding to the blue curve in fact you see that with this model the gain is not going below 0 dB okay so of course this is clearly not acceptable sorry let me show the pole as well so it will look like that and with the blue curve it will look like that one okay now what has happened is although there is the dominant pole response over there because of the effective series resistance the unity uh, loop gain frequency has pushed out to a higher frequency okay this is now the new unity loop gain frequency Now, for uh, small values of the effective series resistance, the unity loop gain frequency is the same as what we calculated without the effective series resistance. But as the effective series resistance increases, it is possible that the 0 will move in within the unity loop gain frequency and the actual unity loop gain frequency will move to a higher frequency. Now, many things can happen here. First of all, the other parasitic uh, poles that we have ignored so far can be now within the new unity loop gain frequency and degrade the phase margin. Okay. So, this effective series resistance can cause problems for stability by increasing the gain at higher frequencies. Okay. So, this is a problem. So, depending on the circuit structure you have, you will have an upper limit on the effective series resistance for which the circuit is stable. Okay. So, what is normally done is that We have the effective series resistance for this capacitor okay. and to make sure that the effect of the effective series resistance is that at high frequencies the impedance of this does not reduce. Okay. So, what is usually done is to have another bypass capacitor which is smaller much smaller than C naught. So, this is also physically smaller. and has a smaller effective series resistance. We will assume that the effective series resistance of C B is negligible. Okay. So, this is what is usually done. So, in this case what happens is at very low frequencies the DC gain is the given by this GM0 times RDS0, okay. That is the DC gain on due to this amplifier M0. And as you go to higher frequencies, there will be a pole due to this C0 plus CB, RESR does not come into picture. And then at some higher frequency, there will be a 0 because this RESR starts dominating the reactance of C0. And finally, at even higher frequency, the reactance of C B becomes smaller than the resistance R E S R and the response is dominated by this capacitance. Okay. So, again if I draw the magnitude response of the gain through the device M0, I will say gain of M0, what it means is from the gate to drain of M0. Okay. We will have the usual G M0, R D S 0 and the first pole will be at 1 over RDS 0, C 0 plus C B. You can uh, evaluate these things by yourselves and then it will start rolling off. Then again it will become a constant 
and this constant value of the gain is given by gm0 times resr and the value of the 0 will be at 1 over c0 resr and at some higher frequency this will start falling off and that frequency is basically 1 over resr times cb in series with c0 okay so all these things you can evaluate by yourself this is the gain profile of uh, the gain through m0 so then if you look at the overall response and the gain of the amplifier let me show it like that that is gm1 r1 times beta so the overall response is given by the dc loop gain then it drops off like that then it can become a constant, but here we have another pole. So it does that, and here we have yet another pole, so it can do that one. So clearly, you can see that when the gain crosses unity, the slope is minus 40 dB per decade, that means that the phase margin has degraded to very poor values. Okay. This is the magnitude response of the loop gain. So what has happened is that now first of all let me it is instructive to on the same plot uh, draw what would happen if there was no ESR then we would simply have response that would go off like that okay. and here this response would uh, do that the way I have drawn it the second pole is just at the unity loop gain frequency, but the phase margin here will be a lot better than a phase margin there. Okay. So basically the effective series resistance will degrade the stability of the circuit. Okay. We will place another capacitor across the main capacitor so that you can maintain a low output impedance at very high frequencies also and because of that uh, there is a, a even more severe constraint on the output resistance of the amplifier. Okay. Basically now we see that the pole of the amplifier here must appear beyond the unity loop gain frequency okay. that means that this pole has to be pushed out even further what we should have is a picture of this sort not like this but uh, something that is sufficiently far away so that instead of uh, this curve we should get even with a high ESR if we want the circuit to be stable we should have the pole somewhere over there. Okay. this is the pole of the amplifier and this frequency is 1 over R01 times CGS0 okay. and it has to be greater than this uh, omega u loop nu and how much is that that is given by this gain which is GM0 times RESR times this particular times this particular pole 
which is given by one over R S R C zero in series with C B. Okay, this uh, symbol means this value is C zero C B by C zero plus C B, and is approximately equal to C B if uh, C zero is much more than C B. Okay. So this unity loop gain frequency nu is nothing but the product of uh, this quantity and that quantity, and that is equal to G M zero divided by C zero series with C B. Okay, and this has to be smaller than one over R O one C G S zero. Okay, and this is a more uh, uh, severe constraint than what we had uh, previously. If we draw the magnitude response for the case where it is going to be stable, gain through M zero would uh, again do this. Okay, this is G M zero R D S zero, and this value is G M zero times R E S R. Okay, and this is. One over R D S zero C zero plus C B. The other pole is one over R S R C zero in series with C B. Okay, and I will show the other amplifier as having a pole at a very high frequency so that it was guaranteed to be stable. This is the pole of the amplifier, and this is one over R O one C G S zero. And the DC gain here is GM one times R one. So the the combined response that is the loop gain magnitude response would be Be of that sort. So it is minus 20 dB per decade there, minus 40, and this is the new unity loop gain frequency. This is minus 20, and this value is GM1 R01 times beta GM0 RDS0. And this value is GM0 RESR times G M one R O one times beta, and this pole is basically given by one over R E S R C O in series with C B. Okay. So the pole at the output of the amplifier one over R O one times C G S zero has to be greater than the new unity loop gain frequency. I will call this uh, omega U loop new. Okay. And that is given by the product of this gain and this pole value. Okay, that is G M zero R E S R G M one R O one times beta times one over R E S R C O in series with C B. Okay, this uh, this symbol means. C O C B by C O plus C B and is approximately equal to C B if uh, C O is much greater than C B. So we have one over uh, R O one C G S zero uh, that which has to be more than G M zero G M one R O one times beta divided by C O in series with C B. Okay, now you can see that this is a much more severe constraint than uh, before. Before we had uh, 
C O over here. Okay, so if I write it as a constraint on R O one, R O one had to be smaller than square root of C G S zero by C zero in series with C B and G M one G M zero times beta. Okay. Now previously we had R O smaller than C G S zero divided by C zero. C zero in series with C B divided by C G S zero times that. Whereas previously we had C zero by C G S zero times G M one G M zero times beta. Okay. Now C zero is much more than C B. So the older limit was greater than the new limit. Okay. Basically, the point here is that because of the effective series resistance of the capacitor C zero at the output, we are forced to put a much smaller capacitor in shunt with it at the output, so that the high frequency impedance again goes down with frequency. But the problem is that the pole now also moves to higher frequency. The unity gain gain frequency moves to also a higher frequency with a sufficiently high effective series resistance. That means that the output resistance of the amplifier that is used for the feedback loop has to have a smaller output resistance. This further limits the DC gain. Okay, so this is one of the chief constraints in designing the voltage regulator in an effective way. We have only looked at the basic voltage regulator. There are a lot more elaborate topologies in which you will use more complicated amplifiers in feedback. But the main constraint is that you are allowed to use a very small quiescent current in the amplifier. That kind of limits your options. You cannot have a very small output resistance at all frequencies. You try to make a very low output resistance at DC by realizing a very high DC loop gain. But the loop gain will be constrained by stability. Okay. This implies that is the load regulation. Okay, so all these things have to be taken into account while designing the voltage regulator. So finally. We have the voltage regulator topology This comes from a band gap. Okay. There are a number of ways of realizing this amplifier. We will look at a very simple example. And also, this transistor M0, this has to be a PMOS for low dropout. That is, if you want the dropout to be of the order of 100 or 200 millivolts, then this has to be a PMOS device. But if the dropout is allowed to be higher because of whatever constraints you have, large difference between V D D and V out, for instance, this can be an N MOS also. If it is an N MOS, then what we will have is instead of this. I will have it like that. Okay. The PMOS part will be replaced by whatever I have shown here and because there is no inversion from the gate to source of the NMOS, 
the signs of these amplifiers will be reversed okay. Now this voltage has to be 1 VGS below that and this itself will be below VDD. So the dropout here will be greater than some VGS plus VD sat okay. So we will need at least 1 volt or so between VDD and this one but for uh, dropouts that are uh, 1 volts or greater you can use the NMOS pass transistor and that can have some advantages because the output the DC output resistance can be lower because you are looking into the source of the transistor which inherently has a low output resistance of 1 over GM and that is further reduced by feedback okay. So now we will look at just one example of realizing the feedback amplifier. So the simplest thing that we can do is to realize a single stage op amp. This is biased with some current mirror and We apply VRAF over there. Assuming that this is 1.2 volts, there is uh, enough room to accommodate this NMOS differential pair. Otherwise, you will have to use PMOS and then fold up the signals. So this is the uh, voltage regulator for efficiency you should use a small crescent current okay and also the output voltage here will be VRF times 1 plus R1 by R2 but also it includes the offset of the amplifier that is used. So it will be VOS times also 1 plus R1 by R2 okay. So for accuracy this has to be minimized. So for this it means that you have to use large devices okay. Not only these, but also these, okay. All of them contribute to the offset. So, that is the standard way of reducing the input referred offset of any amplifier, and that has to be done as well, okay. One of the important criteria of a voltage regulator is its accuracy, and in order to maintain accuracy, you have to use large devices. There are a lot more refinements to this voltage regulator, which you can see in the literature. Uh, in the direction of increasing the uh, power supply rejection ratio and improving the loop gain and so on and so forth okay. So that brings us to the end of uh, references and uh, voltage regulators. The next topic that we will deal with is filters that is another uh, class of analog circuits that is used for selecting certain frequencies and uh, rejecting other frequencies. There are uh, essentially two kinds of uh, analog filters that are uh, frequently realized. One is uh, continuous time filters which basically operate on continuous time signals and the other is switch capacitor filters or discrete time filters okay. Now again as with the uh, recent uh, blocks that we discussed we will not go into great detail about the operation and design of filters we will just outline how to design them and point out some major issues okay. These are basically used for uh, selecting certain frequencies that is selecting signals of certain frequencies and rejecting other frequencies and broadly there are uh, four classes based on uh, which one you select and which one you reject. 
the transfer function magnitude is what I am drawing here versus omega in this case it allows uh, low frequency signals and rejects high frequency signals I will show this as one and whatever is allowed is called the pass band and whatever is uh, removed is called the stop band and whatever is in the middle where it has to change from uh, allowing something that is a high magnitude response to rejecting something which is a low magnitude response this is called the transition band okay and this type of filter which has a high magnitude at low frequencies that is allows low frequency signals is known as a low pass filter okay and there is a type that rejects both low and high frequency signals and allows some intermediate frequency signals this is the pass band and this is known as a band pass filter and there are filters that are complementary that is something that rejects low frequencies and allows high frequencies and such a thing is known as a high pass filter and there are also filters that reject certain band but allow higher and lower frequencies and those are known as band stop or band reject filters okay. So essentially these are linear time invariant systems that is some linear circuits which are frequency dependent they have capacitors and possibly inductors in them and they have a certain transfer function that is a certain transfer function between the input and output which behaves like this okay. Now there are a number of steps involved in the design of a filter. So first of all you will have a specification of which frequencies to accept and which frequencies to reject and by how much that is the amount of attenuation in the stop band okay. Based on these things you select a certain type of filter there are many different types of filters and uh, depending on the uh, steepness of the transition band that is how quickly you want to go from allowing the signals to rejecting the signals that is over what frequency range should you have the transition you decide the type of the filter and the order of the filter and from there you go to some uh, prototype realization and finally uh, realize the uh, filter in active form okay. We will only be dealing with a certain part of uh, this whole process. Filter design involves which is basically usually decided by the normal specification looks like this. If you see books you will be given something of the sort that is this will be the pass band and this will be the stop band and you will be given some region where you can have your response okay your response can look like that or your response could look like that and so on okay. So exactly which one it follows depends on the type of the filter basically one of the crucial things is the range of frequencies over which it has to change from a low attenuation that is passing the signal to a high attenuation that is rejecting the signal okay. So based on this you choose the type and order okay essentially you choose the transfer function of the filter.
okay this transfer function h of s can be realized in many forms with passive or active and in passive case in general you will need r l and c in active filters you could use uh, active elements plus l and c or only active elements and c okay so we will uh, look at only this particular type of uh, uh, filters which is realized using active elements that is transistors and capacitors okay and also we will entirely skip the discussion of how to derive the uh, type of filter and order of filter from the specifications and so on we assume that the transfer function of the filter is known to us and there is something known as a prototype realization that is also known to us okay from this there is uh, something known as a passive prototype okay a large class of uh, active filters are synthesized starting from the passive prototypes so we will assume that these things are given and work from these to get our filter topology okay now just as a, a quick mention of this the type of filter could include uh, butterworth chebyshev inverse chebyshev elliptic and bessel and so on okay and there could be other types as well the process of uh, doing these things which we are not treating can be done with uh, matlab or with some uh, filter tables there is an extensive book of tables published by an author named zverev so one of these things we assume is the source of the transfer function h of s and the passive prototype and from this we will go on to synthesize our filters okay i will first uh, quickly take an example of a, a filter which is a low order that is second order and then uh, go from there to see how we can generalize to higher order filters okay I will also assume that the filter we are interested in is a low pass filter. Uh, it turns out that most often low pass and band pass filters are used and those are the two filters that we will uh, discuss in this course. So what does it mean to have a second order transfer function and prototype? The transfer function of a second order low pass filter is given by 1 by S square by omega p square plus s by q omega p plus 1 so this has a dc gain of 1 and a natural frequency of omega p and a quality factor of q okay and this is what we have to realize and in general if you plot uh, the magnitude of uh, v naught by vi versus omega you will see something of this sort okay now typically you will also know the passive prototype which can realize this and it can be in the form of this rlc circuit okay this is a very common uh, form of uh, the prototype where you have these two termination resistances which is why it is called doubly terminated and you have lossless LC ladder between the terminations which is why this is known as the ladder prototype okay so what we'll do 
is we take this uh, ladder prototype and try to synthesize it in active form. Okay. When we say try to synthesize it, what we mean is there are certain uh, relationships between voltages and currents in this uh, ladder filter. We will try to do it with active elements and capacitors okay. and then later we will generalize it to higher order filters. It turns out that any higher order filter can be decomposed into a cascade of second order filters. That is if you have a higher order polynomial, you can factor it out into second order polynomials or if the polynomial is of an odd order, a number of second order polynomials and a first order polynomial okay. Now that it turns out gives us two ways of realizing higher order filters. You can first factor out the higher order filter into a number of low order filters, number of second order filters and possibly a first order filter. We can realize each of those second order filters and the first order filter and put them one after another that is one way and another way is you start with a higher order ladder that is a ladder which has lot more L's and C's than just the two I have shown here and synthesize that directly okay. So based on these, we will show how to synthesize higher order filters and point out some important steps in the process of designing filters. Now there is an extensive literature on filter design both active and passive so you can refer to those things for details. What we do in this course are meant to be just guidelines of the important steps involved in active filter design. Thank you, I will see you in the next lecture.